Consider it all joy. Let's go back to verse 2. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith endu it produces endurance. Let endurance have its perfect results or work, that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. Now, see that word lacking? Keep that in mind because it's going to be carried over. Lacking in nothing. In, but any of you lack wisdom regard, in regard to verses 2, 3, and 4, which is undeserved suffering in your life. Undeserved suffering in your life, which we, talk, we have talked about here in these verses. Any of you lack wisdom in regard to undeserved suffering in your life. And let me tell you, it will come to your life, and it's good. God does nothing bad. All things work together for good. But sometimes we really struggle in bringing that into the reality of our life. There are things that happen to our life. We did not intentionally do it. It wasn't because we were in a sinful state. We're not being disciplined for it. We didn't do it because it... We went against all good common sense advice that could be given to us and made poor decisions. Listen to me. It was a gift handed you by God, and it's called suffering. And it's as much a grace gift to your life as your salvation. And it's a very meaningful part of your life for developing you, or God wouldn't have gave it to you. And it's a speed course. <laughs> and boy, he will, you will know that you're in a speed course when you get in it. You will whirl through your life in this thing, and it will dominate and control your conversation for a pretty good while. And often, not being able to understand and adjust to these things, we really struggle with that. I mean, it, it can affect your... If you're not on top of your game spiritually, it can affect your life materially, maybe work. It can affect your life spiritually. What, dear God, what is going on? Is there no resolution to this? You go to the doctors and they go like, geez, I don't know what to tell you. They get into why me, God. It affects your marriage. Uh, can affect your 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 family life. It can affect your social life. It, it can it, it can affect your your advancement spiritually. I've seen people in undeserved suffering that it just dominated so much of their life physically, in pain and such things. And can I tell you what you should pray for? This is what James says. Ask for wisdom. Now, you may not know what wisdom is, and when we get through here today, you will. So you'll be able to make this request and know that God will promise you and answer it. Here we go. If any of you lack wisdom in regard to undeserved suffering, that's where we are contextually. Let him ask of God. That's an imperative. That's a command. You're to ask of God. I'm in, listen, I'm in a straight, I, I don't, listen, I, I don't know how this got to me. I don't know why it happened to me. I don't know how to explain it in me. I know it's affecting my life in so many different ways. I am really struggling to try to get my head wrapped around it. Here's what he says to and he commands you. It's a present imperative as he commands you. He said, I want you to pray till you get it. That's a present tense. I want, you to, I want you to continue to pray. And I'm going to show you some really spiritual guys that struggle with this. So you're not alone. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. That's a present imperative. You get into, you get into asking for wisdom how to deal with this in your personal life that you can get on with your life and feel confident with God that he's got all of this in control and this is 
developing you into some character that God is after in your life, that this is the way he's going to manage you. And he did it with Paul. And Paul was at the top of his spiritual life and game. And uh, he did it with others as well. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Now watch this. Here's your promise attached to the wisdom. Now you pray for wisdom, and here's how it's going to, here's how it's going to play out. God, you're going to ask for God's wisdom. You're going to ask wisdom from God, right? This is not just wisdom. This is wisdom from God. It's, it means it's going to come through the word. Listen, it's coming through this word. The, the, not only is it going to come through the word in a much greater way to your life, but it's coming to your life today as you said in undeserved suffering. And this is going to be a breakthrough in your life. This lesson here will change your whole life if you want change. And it's going to come from internal. Not external. May not change your, may not change your suffering until God gets through with whatever he's doing with it. But will change your attitude and your outlook and your perspective and your confidence and your inner peace, and your contentment. That God has it all planned out. If you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, and here's the promise, who gives to all men generously. What's he given? Wisdom. Who gives to all men who ask generously and without reproach. He doesn't chide you. He's not, going to he's not going to say to you, well, you know, you got enough doctrine to kind of move along in here. How come you haven't moved along? He's not going to do that. He's, did he not promise you he wouldn't do that? Without reproach. He's not going to rebuke you. He's not going to scold you because you're struggling. Look, he, here's what he's saying. I know you're going to struggle. I, I know that. You come and ask for wisdom. I'm not going to chide you. What are you asking for wisdom? You ought to be smart enough. What are you He's not going to do that. He's promised. Has he not promised you? So don't do it to yourself. Don't sit around and beat yourself up because you're in undeserved suffering. You don't know why. Why me, God? Why now? Why this? Why that? Man, forget it. He's not going to do that to you, so don't do it to yourself. Don't sit around and beat yourself up because you can't control your life. That's one of the lessons he's going to teach you. Son, you've never been in control of your life since I got you saved, but you have been. I let you think it for a while, but now that time's over. You've grown up. I let you grow up. Listen, I let you do that mess because you're a baby. You're mature enough now. Now it's enough. We're not going to do that anymore. We're going to use the potty now. We're not going to use the diaper. Okay? Okay. I may have not been good for this early in the morning, but... Who gives to all men generously and without reproach. And listen, here it is. Here's the bottom line. It will be given to him. It will be given. Right? See the word given here? And see the word gives? Same, it's the same word in the Greek. Ditto me. Same word. Does God give it? As he promised you, he'll give it. It's on the way. Just be patient. It's all based on what? Asking for wisdom. Let him ask in faith without any doubting. And, I, and then that goes on to a whole nother deal. I just want to deal with the first half of this. I want to deal with the first half of this today. Pray for wisdom. Pray for wisdom. Okay? So let's have prayer and pray for wisdom. Okay? I gave you a moment of silence as a believer, priest, and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, the privilege. We call it classroom etiquette around here. In preparation for Bible study, this is the name of the game. It's a spiritual book, the Bible is, for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You have to receive the word of God as a spiritual person indwelt under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And it has to be applied to your life. 
Jesus told his disciples, the Holy Spirit will teach you and recall Bible doctrine to your life. Both in the good times, the critical times, at all times, the Holy Spirit is there to minister to you the word of God. There can be no unconfessed sin in your life. You can't study the Bible nor apply the Bible in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude type of sins. It could be sins of the tongue or overt sins. If you're aware of these today, both by conscience and conviction by the Holy Spirit, you should confess that sin, that specific sin, name it and cite it to God in the silence of your priesthood as a believer. And the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if you confess it, he will forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And that's essential, not only for your spiritual life momentum, but it's essential for your spiritual growth momentum and your relationship to God as you study his word this morning. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way to study with us, and I pray this, this lesson for the person who is not undeserved suffering, it's coming. Jesus said in Philippians, Lord, in Philippians 129, that it was granted that we believe in Christ Jesus and suffer for his namesake. There are a lot of different ways to suffer, and God picks the ones that he can, excel, can accelerate, accelerate spiritual growth in the life of a person. There, it's not always the same method in undeserved suffering. But he will give it in order to accelerate spiritual growth momentum and bring you to a place, bring the believer to a place of spiritual maturity where he can serve God and be so content and joyous with it, no matter what the circumstances of life. We, this is the prayer we pray today on behalf of this congregation and those who have, who have dropped by to visit with us today and study with us through the Internet. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is where we're going in today's study. Notice at the very top of your paper, I wrote out this verse 5. Verse 5, I told you in the, in the beginning, is a continuation of the subject that has been brought up in verses 2, 3, and 4. I call it a trailer hitch that's pulling this subject that was discussed 2, 3, and 4 now into 5 through 8, a trailer hitch. It's carrying this into another place. And, he, and, and now a, a, a real thorough discussion. He's discussed how... Consider it joy, and we talked about the aspects of undeserved suffering in 2, 3, and 4, and now he's talking about something crucial for you to get a hold of this in your own life where you can be find some contentment with it, understanding what God is doing with you, and then to be able to take that information and apply it to your personal life in what's called wisdom. It did, listen... You know why he didn't ask you to ask? He didn't say ask for knowledge, did he? There's a difference between knowledge and we didn't ask you. You know why? Because you already got it. The people in verses 2, 3, and 4 already had the knowledge. They lacked the wisdom. Did he not say you lack wisdom? Yeah, he said you lack it. Ask for it because you lack it. <laughs> they didn't lack knowledge. <clears throat> Listen, if you lack knowledge... You wouldn't have been into undeserved suffering. Do you understand that? Well, you ought to write this on your paper, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. That's the proof text. I mean, you don't put babies through that. This undeserved suffering, this is not for babies. This is people who have been potty trained. I mean, this, this is an adult life now. This is not a baby life. You know, it's no longer diapers. It's a potty. And you, once you get to the potty, that's, that's there for life until maybe the end of it. And then we're back to diapers again. But hopefully not us, right? Hopefully not. Well, anyhow, so what we have in the word, now the second word in that verse, notice important, is the word if. And listen, this verse is so important to you. If you're here today and you know that you're into some kind of suffering, 
it has to be one of three kinds. It's either self-induced, and you know that. If you don't, your wife or somebody who loves you will tell you. <laughs> Undeserved. Or it could be deserved because you've got, in your, you've got sin in your life and you've dropped in on it and, and the Lord is trying to pull you out of it, right? It's like a car in a ditch. You can't get it out. And two or three people come by and can't get it out. You've got to need God. You need God. You need the big record to come in and pull you out. If it's neither of those two things, then your suffering is undeserved. It's undeserved. And that's important. That word, if, notice it's a 1cc. That's a first-class condition. That's, not, that's not, not a hypo prescription. That's a first-class condition. It means that it's true. So it should read like this. It should read like this in James. If any of you lack wisdom, and you do. Here they are. They're in the midst of struggling of undeserved suffering. They're struggling in their faith about it. They're just trying to, trying to wrap their brain around it. They know that all things work together for good, for God, but they have, they're struggling with this aspect. They're struggling with the aspect of the actual suffering. It's not a theory anymore. It's not going to, buy, going to Bible study like some of you right now, and you hear about undeserved suffering, and you don't have any. And so, you know, but you, you're here and you know it. And you're struggling with it. You're struggling with the idea of why and what's going on and why me and all of those questions that are legitimate can be answered today if you'll listen to the, what he tells you to do. So the word if is very important. If you're here today or by automobile or by internet, if any of you lack, notice the word lack. Notice in verse 4, it is the same word lack, lepo. He says, in fact, he says, you ought to be in a, in a relationship with God in suffering in your life where you what? What's he tell you in verse 4? That you lack what? Nothing. But they're struggling with it because they, they can't come to grips with that. They're struggling with it. They are struggling with the application. Wisdom is the application of Bible doctrine into the reality of your life in midst of what you are struggling with. That's wisdom. It's the practical application of categorical Bible doctrine, some specific doctrine, in this case, undeserved suffering, and in that undeserved suffering, God is trying to deal with you on something that is very important to where he wants to take you in your life in the plan of God. Otherwise, it wouldn't be there. When you study the book of Job, the entire book of Job is about this man's undeserved suffering, its entire book. I mean, you could start writing a book now, couldn't you? If you're in it, you could. And if Paul is correct in, in Philippians 1.29, we're all going to go through it at some point or another. And listen, it's, they're all different kinds of character. You know, he says various, in verse uh, 3, or verse 2, he says there, when you encounter various testings, and we went through the two different words for testing in here, and all of that already. See, you don't lack knowledge if you've been with me in this study so far. It's a matter now of having wisdom of the application of what you already know to bring it into the reality where your suffering is, to match them up. Does that make sense to you? He wants you to match them up. It's like going to a doctor and he says, oh, yeah, I know what you got. I know exactly what you need. I've had a lot of people in this week. They got the same thing. So here it is, and here's the prescription. When you put them both together, you're better. That's what we're trying to do with you today. We will absolutely do it today. We will absolutely do it. If you have ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to believe, we, we'll do this. We'll, we'll, we'll do that today. I am confident we'll do that. I am confident what I'm about to tell you. If any of you lack wisdom, 
lack wisdom, Sophia. Let him ask. Know that, notice that's a present imperative. And, and we're talking about making a prayer. That's the reason it's called pray for wisdom. And God will give God. Here's a principle. That's a participle. God who gives. This is a, a doctrinal principle on this, on, this, on this part of praying for undeserved suffering. Who gives to all generously. And that's an adjunctive chi because of two participles. These two participles are linked into a promise from God for you today who gives, notice that's a pre present active participle uh, of all, to all generously, and which is an adjunctive chi connecting two participles, in this case, without reproach, with a negative, without reproach, present active participle. You see that? We call that an adjunctive in the Greek language. These two things are set up into an absolute promise. And it's important to you if you're going to, if you are in undeserved suffering, these are two things you need to hear today. You need to hear in your praying for wisdom, God is going to answer your prayer in a two-pronged way with these two participles. First, no, he's going to give you relief. No, he's going to give you answers. No, he's going to carry you through. No, he has this on your life for something good in the plan of God to bring you. And when God shows you down the line, it's going to be a little while, but when he finally develops you and gets you on board with his way of thinking about this, when he pulls the idea back on that with you, you will see why he's developing you, your wife or family, uh, people close to you will see why, and you will sit there and praise him for it. Oh, you're not ready yet. I know that. I'm just trying to tell you we're getting you ready. I'm going to tell you take the medicine. I'm just talking about it right now. I'm going to lay out the medicine. Here it is. One, the first participle is a, is a principle regarding this. Who gives to all, not some. Don't sit around and whine. Oh, I guess he did it this because... Something happened in my life 20 years ago before I knew Christ, and now he's, now quit that foolishness. It's none of that. Here's the part of simple. He will, you ask, he will give it to all generously and without reproach. Now, I've explained that to you. And watch, and here's the final deal. And he, the two participles are going to now find its fulfillment in the verb Didomai, the word give is didomai in a participle. Now he brings it back. He puts, he put with a conjunction, he put two participles looking for a main verb. And the main verb is going to be, and it will be given. That's a future passive indicative. Where is it going to come from? God. You know why? Because you ask for wisdom. And here's how you can measure you take the pills, you know, at every meal. You know what I'm saying? Here's the prescription. The participle, two participles. God will give to all generously, without reproach. It will be given. You know, we, we used to say, you can take that to the bank. That check will go through. You can cash that check. The need to pray for wisdom was the result of struggling within the faith cycle somewhere regarding the real time, the reality of the, do of the doctrine of undeserved suffering in their lives. It was in real time. The doctrine, the knowledge of undeserved suffering was now working in real time. You know, I had no idea where I was going to go with my studies. And I began about three months ago praying where I want to do a book on Sunday. Where should I go, Father? And I spent like three months in prayer. And he said about two months into that, about the second month in praying about that, I looked at different books and I go, nah, I'm not comfortable with it. I'd look at another book. I'm not comfortable with it. I went through that for about Six weeks, seven weeks. And he said, the book of James. And I said, I'm not interested in the book of James. 
That's not one of my favorite books. I've taught that book before. It's, it went, then it's not for you. It's for your people. The book is not, then, in, then the book, if they feel that way, then the book isn't for you. Well, I don't like that idea. Why would I want to give teach something that wasn't good for me? So I realized I had to have an attitude adjustment. So I bring you the book of James, and I'll tell you, from the first moment I began to preach the book, I knew that that was a wonderful book to teach to my people. I knew it in my heart. I knew it in my heart. And I'm going to tell you, if, if this message is for you today, somewhere this book is going to meet every one of your needs. I promise you, this book will meet every one of your needs. You stay with me in this book. This book, this book will change your life in ways you have no idea. Well, here we are with undeserved suffering. In undeserved suffering. I've got, I don't know, five points. They were struggling, this congregation that James is speaking to, this group of people that he's writing to, were struggling with the faith cycle. There was a breakdown in the faith cycle somewhere in their life because he's going to tell you that in verse 5. Look at verse 5 again. If any of you like, well, let him ask of God. Then verse 6, let him ask in faith. See, there's a breakdown of faith cycle somewhere, and they couldn't, they couldn't wrap their brain around it. Somewhere they were, they were struggling with what God was doing in their life. You know, we don't struggle when he's given us all blessings, right? But when he gives us suffering, we, until we understand that that's a good thing and not a bad thing, that that's just as good as, I mean, that's a blessing. And what we're trying to do is to get you in that suffering to come in and accept it as a blessing because it is. It's just hard to do it when you're in the reality of time, when it's coming in your life and it's affecting your work, your marriage, your health, your this, yada, yada, yada. See, you're writing the book of Job, aren't you? They were struggling with the faith cycle. There was a breakdown in there. Uh, in the faith cycle, they were struggling with the faith cycle so that undeserved suffering was not producing the perfect, complete, lacking in nothing concept in, their, in, their, in their, their personal life. Now, what he's trying to do is bring your life, and we talked about this last time, and if you, if, if you need that information, you should back, go back up and pick up. John, it's, on, it's, on, it's ready to go now, John. Uh, the lesson from 2-4, yeah, it's ready. You go on our website, you pull that down, you study that, you study that like you've got a big test coming. Because it's already there. <laughs> right? All right. And if it's not there, it's coming. So for those, th those of you, go back and you will, you will see we explain what it means to be perfect and what it means because that's the goal. The goal of this undeserved suffering is to bring, bring the concept that God has into your life of perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. Because I'll tell you, Go back and study because you've already got these three things in turmoil in your life. What, what this suffering is intended by God to do is to bring you into a place of, of, of spiritual completeness and, and, and where this is affecting you on a positive way, body, soul, and spirit, and into a place where you're no longer worried about what you're lacking because of the suffering, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't do this, I can't do that. I know. But I'm not at, you're not at a place where you think you're not lacking in nothing. See, he's got to bring you to a place where you're, you, you know why? Because, listen, your life, he wants to take you to a place in your life where you know that, it, listen, your life doesn't depend on you, it depends on God. Your monthly bill, your monthly work, this and that, this and that, your health, whatever it is. And what he wants to do is take you through suffering where you understand that God is a God of your body, soul, and spirit. He wants to bring into holistic, spiritual holisticness where the word of God is affecting you in three categories, not just one or two. Listen, the world knows this. The world has a term when your souls are not 
whole and spiritually. They call it psychosomatic illnesses, right? The, the world understands this stuff. How is it that the church doesn't? The whole life of spirituality is to make you wholesome, body, soul, and spirit, where it's, you're like a fine-running machine spiritually. Well, anyhow. So, because these, the undeserved suffering is not reaching its goal in the Christian life of perfect, complete, lacking in nothing, they can't count it joy. They can't count it joy. They would like to. They know the Bible says they should consider it all joy, count it all joy. They know they should, but they're struggling with how, the, how can I do that? I mean, because you, you haven't reached that place where these things that you can see the results of the positiveness of it in your life. So there's been a breakdown in the faith cycle, and what he tells you to do is you don't need more knowledge. What you need is wisdom. You've got to go back there and fix the, you've got to break down in the mechanics of the, of the faith cycle. You've got to go back and you've got to stop. You've got to go back there and you've got to tune it up. And that's what we're going to try to talk to you about today, but that's the point. They, they're, they're in a place where they can't count it all joy. Maybe one day they can, but they can't count it. Maybe as a couple you're going through this where one of you is in undeserved suffering and the other isn't, and it's very difficult. You feel bad for that person. You, both of you feel bad for the other person because you can't meet all the needs and you think that way and you just feel like you're lacking in some things. But listen, you should be la lacking in what? Not one thing. Right? Isn't that the goal? The Father's goal in your life is to get you there. You just need to go back to study 2, 3, and 4. The key word that's been pulled out of Verse 4 into verse 5 is the word lack. It is important that they acknowledge that they lack the wisdom, for example, to successfully complete the faith cycle and find a place in their life where they can be content and have joy with the suffering going on in their life. They need the wisdom of God to address a breakdown and to fix it so that it doesn't keep happening in the Christian way of life. He's going to fix something that's been going on. He's going to fix it. And we're going to get done with this. We're going to fix it. Because, listen, it's affecting you in one area. And he's, and, and in a lot of areas, he's, he's, he's stopped it. He pulled it out together, put you in some under his own suffering to speed this fix up. You understand? Well, hang in there. Let me show you the importance of the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26. Write that on your paper. John 14, 26. So it's not in your paper. You know, I don't write everything down. All right. John 14, 26. But this is dynamite. Because it says the indwelling. Listen to me now. The indwelling Holy Spirit. Is he, listen. Is a, you're under undeserved suffering. And you have an attitude. One day you're up. Next day you're down. The other day you're down. The next, the, you know, up and down. Listen. Has the Holy Spirit left your life because you haven't been able to adjust all this going on? Nah. John 14, 16, he can never leave. He's in for the hall. He's in for the duration. You ought to know that in your marriage. Don't be bailing out. Nobody bails out. You fix it. Don't bail out. Holy Spirit, don't bail out. He helps you fix it. The indwelling Holy Spirit, this is the job that needs to be fixed from the inside. Can't be fixed from the outside. It's got to be fixed from the inside. So God put the Holy Spirit in us to help us fix these things. John 14, 26 says, the Holy Spirit is there to teach and recall. You know what teach is? That's knowledge. You know what recall? Recall is where wisdom comes from. Let's get into application. Recalling for application. If it's not application for your life, it's application for somebody else's. Agreed? Come on now. Do you not share the word of God with people in trouble? Do you not give them a word? You know what it is to their life? A word of wisdom. You know what it is from your life? A word of knowledge. A word of knowledge transferred to somebody else that's struggling with the thing that could fix it is a word of wisdom. See, you didn't realize how smart you were, did you? 
And listen, most of us do it all the time and don't think about it. And that's a wonderful thing. It shows a sign of maturity in your life. It's a natural reflex. The Holy Spirit is there to help you do that. You don't have to do this alone. You're not smart enough to do this alone. You're asking for wisdom. You don't have it. <laughs> You're asking for God's wisdom. And listen, did he tell you he would give it to you? Did he tell you he would give it to every person? And would he tell you, did, and he'd tell you would he give you a, a bushel load? Truck load, whatever your biggest hauler is. He said generously. That's about as good as it gets, doesn't it? Somebody comes to you and said, I'd like to give you a pay raise. What do you want? And say, you be, listen, here's a smart answer. Be generous. That's a God thing, isn't it? Be generous. Now be happy. Just be generous. Give from a good heart. Now be happy. That's how God deals with you and I. Out of a good heart. So James instructs us. Oh, hey, here's one. Write this down. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. I'm going to show you something that's going to be important to you today about this thing of breakdown. Because somewhere there's a breakdown in the faith cycle. Look. I gave you Galatians 5, 22, 23, right? You know what that's about? That's the nine fruits of the Spirit. Nine fruit of the Spirit. You know what one of them is? It's mistranslated in the English. In the English, they say faithfulness. But if you have a Greek text, you know that it's not faithfulness. It's faith. It's faith. T-I-S, right? T-I-S? Mm -hmm. And this is the place where it really works. When there's a breakdown in the faith cycle. The power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit to fix it internally so that we can work on the outside and help other people fix it in their life. It's a magnificent principle. So James, James instructs us, James instructs us uh, to pray for wisdom regarding the doctrinal breakdown within the faith cycle, uh, those who lack faith. If you lack wisdom, notice in this, this verse, if you lack wisdom, if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And then he comes back in verse 6 and says, let him ask, stay with it in faith. Let him ask in faith. It's a, a powerful instruction from James. Sophia, listen to me. Sophia is the practical application of knowledge in real time in your life. It's a practical, it's a practical application of categorical Bible doctrine that you have in knowledge. In real time, real time application real time, reality time, real time in your life. The second thing I want you to understand about this thing is James commanded them to ask of God for wisdom regarding their struggle. A command. It's a present act of imperative. A command. Regarding the struggle. The struggle that is why me? Why now? Why this way? Why that? I mean, you're full of the why questions. That's okay. You're identifying I'm struggling. James wants to resolve it in your life because the struggle is sometimes worse than the suffering. The struggle. They're both S words. And sometimes the struggle is longer than the suffering. It's more intense. It's more trying to get some re resolution to why. The answer, all the whys. Listen, throw the whys out. You know, you, you put in Philippians 1.29, take the whys out. Under the, put in Romans 8.28 through 31. The whys, listen, the whys is not the, the reason. There's been a breakdown somewhere. 
that he's going to fix. And also in this, he's going to teach you a lot about suffering and where he's going to take you, where, where he's got... See, God has design for you. He has design for you. He has eyes on you. He's got a design for your life. You go, oh, you must be talking about somebody else, Ron. No, are you a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? This is true with every believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not just a guy like me or Billy Graham or somebody like that. He cares about every child of God this way. And he's got, he's got, He's got dibs on you. He, he wants you to fulfill his destiny that he has for you. We all have one. Our destiny is not just to die and go to heaven. It's to fulfill our creative purpose in the divine plan of God. I want to show you something. Go to Romans. We, we talk about Romans 8 all the time. I want to show you something. We talk about Romans 8, 28. Let's go to Romans 8. Eight. Let's, but let's start at verse 26. Because if you have a study Bible, that's where they're going to start. If you have a study Bible, they'll break it down. Like mine here, uh, New American Standard I have says, our victory in Christ. That's, that's how they subtitled it. They probably subtitled yours a different way. And it's a study Bible. Listen, listen to what it says. But I want to read through verse 31 and gather the whole picture for your soul. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses for we do not know how to pray as we should but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words what what did God ask you to do he asked you to pray for what wisdom is the Holy Spirit all over that request right and and you're and you're struggling you're weak and you're I, meaning, I, I, what's going on? What we, and you go, look, don't talk in the flesh. <laughs> That's flesh talk. Don't talk in the flesh. Those are, those are none issues. Let's talk in the spirit. Because so this is what it's about, how, 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 we, how we should pray, right? You pray in the Holy Spirit. Don't be praying in the weakness of your flesh. Pray in the strength of the Holy Spirit. You understand? <laughs> if you want to cry, it's all right. I don't care. But Don't speak to God in the weakness of the flesh. Speak to him in the strength of the spirit. All right? And, and notice that the spirit speaks too deep for words. What are you speaking in out of your weakness? Oh, whiny words. Whiny, whiny, whiny words. And he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is. Look how God has connected your heart who's praying in weakness to the Spirit who's praying over it. Ah, Father, look. He's, look, he's had a tough day. <laughs> da, 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 da. Because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. See, the whole part of prayer is, are you praying according to the will of God? In weakness, you're not. The Holy Spirit corrects that. Well, Father, he's just having kind of a... Uh, uh, Father go like, look. So the Spirit is going to take that prayer and connect it into the will of God. Now, that's what he wants you to do on your own. Get out of your weakness. Get into the strength of the Holy Spirit. Be able to speak knowledge back to the Father. Speak the Word of God back to him. What the Father wants to hear from your lips in, in suffering is what the will of God is, and that is speak back what you know knowledge-wise about the categorical doctrine of undeserved suffering to him. And if you know more than that, if you know actually what God has already put in your heart, what he wants you to do, and you've not been doing it, that's going to come up. Oh, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Struggling with this. Is he struggling with it? When you read Matthew 26. You know what he has to come down to? You know what it all boils down to? Not my will. 
but thy will be done. You know what the Holy Spirit's job in you to do is to get you into, out of your will and into the will of God so that we can get a prayer to the Father that will come back in a powerful way of your life. Agreed? The Son of God went through this. Who are you? And we know, verse 28, now he says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose, his divine plan. Then he goes in, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That's what all undeserved suffering is for. In real time, to bring you out of yourself and into the self of Christ, right? Out of my image, which you're stuck into, into the image of Christ. That's, what, that, that's the bottom line in there. Conformed to the image of Christ. Conformed to the image of son. That he might be the firstborn among the brethren you being one of them, and whom he predestined, these things also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these also he glorified. You know what he's just done? He's just run. You know why God saved you? In his de Listen, he has a divine plan over you and a will over your life. And part of this struggle that you're having at undeserved suffering is to get you out of what your will is for your life to surrender to what God's will is for your life because that's where all things work together for good. Where it's good in you, not just in God's heart, but it's you and God are, are in the same thinking. Now look at verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? You know, the worst person to be against you is you. That's what he told Jesus in the garden. Son, you know what the worst, the worst enemy is against you? It's not Peter. It's not your disciples. It's not Israel. It's you. Don't be your worst enemy. Listen, he beat every enemy until the, until the hour of the cross. Now he's struggling with his. How about that? So don't get down on yourself. Get up on God. That's a powerful idea. It's a powerful idea. These believers are promised that God will respond by giving all graciously and without reproach, and it will be given. That's con conditionally based on grace. That's conditionally based on grace. Not yourself. Here is a prayer for wisdom with a promise of getting it. I mean, does God want, listen, is it God's will that you get knowledge? Do you know what? You know what trumps knowledge? Wisdom. You know what trumps knowledge? Wisdom. If all you got is knowledge, Paul said in Corinthians 8.1, it'll get you all puffed up. And then God has to let the air out. So that, that knowledge takes you to wisdom. The whole purpose of knowledge is to get you to wisdom. If all you have is knowledge and you don't have wisdom, wisdom is being able to bring God into the most extreme episodes of your life and you be content that he's got it. Not just thinking he's got it and worrying about that he doesn't. <laughs> Come on now. Don't equate the knowledge of the Bible with wisdom from God. You understand that, don't you? Because it's all about taking will, it's all about taking knowledge out of your hands, will, and putting them back into the hands of God, will. That's what he taught his son to get him prepared to go to the cross. Three. The wisdom of God, Sophia, is practical application of specific categorical Bible doctrine. It is important to cycle this doctrine through faith, the faith cycle. If you want to get a good look at wisdom, 
You read Proverbs chapter 1 through 8. That's all, that's what it's about. You know what wisdom is? It's the practical, practical application of pertinent Bible doctrine in real time in your life. So that you can say, not my will, but thy will be done. And, and actually consider it joyful. People, that snowball is rolling your way. All right, do you, listen, do you believe that Christ died for your sins were buried and raised from the dead third day? Mm -hmm. Do you consider yourself advancing spiritually uh, through the word of God? Mm -hmm. Then know this for sure. As you have believed, you will suffer for Christ. Because we're in the devil's world and you will suffer for Christ and it will be a good thing. It won't be a bad thing. The wisdom, Sophia, is practical application of specific categorical Bible doctrine and that being cycled through the faith cycle is very important. So I put that cycle down there because it's essential. What I didn't put down there are the three things that are important that you need to remember. There is the directive will because it's about the will of God. It's about the will of God working out in your life where you stop saying, my will, my will, my will, and feeling miserable and turn it over to the will of God, the will of God, and consider it joyful, not miserable. I hate my life. Why was I ever born? Did I get saved for this? I don't know, you know. So, three wills. Here are the three things you need to know about the will of God. There's a directive will of God. That's what he tells you specifically he wants. There's the permissive will of God. That's what he permits until he, has, he goes like, okay, enough's enough. You're ready. You're ready. Putting a stop to that business. And there's the overruling will of God. Okay? The overruling will of God where he allows you to drift a little bit because you're immature and he allows you to, to get enough information to put a halt to that and pull you back in. You know, he's an enormously patient God. We will put up with somebody like that for a minute. And it's amazing to me how much, I mean, he will put up with us for years. It's, it's, he's the most patient God in the whole wide world. You talk about a father figure, there's one. So you got, now when you come to the directive will of God where he lays out what he wants you to do, there are three things in it. These three things always have to line up. Undeserved suffering is one of those directive wills. The three things got to line. There's always, and they're always going to be this way. There's always going to be a geographic. There's going to be a place where this is going to take place, a place and a time. There's going to be a mental will of God. How should I be thinking as I'm going through this? And there's going to be an operational will of God. How do I deal with it? How do I deal with it scripturally? How do I deal with it in the plan of God? And I'm going to tell you, if you're a believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you better get this stuff because this is your life. And it's for a good reason, and it's a good thing. And you need to know this information because, listen, there are so many people suffering today. For all the, for all the, in all the categories, undeserved and Self-induced and divine discipline than that. In that, pray, in that cycle, you have the hearing and the believing side. You have the application and the completing side. You ought to draw a line through that. Divide those two into halves. And on the hearing and believing side, you should put the promises. This is where he gives you the promises. This is the learning side. The application and completing side is where the performance, like Romans, listen to me, Romans 4.21. Being fully assured that what he had promised, he is able to perform. Over here is the promise side. Over here is the performance side. Over here is the learning side. 
over here is the living side. Are you with me? Over here is where I'm introduced to the will of God. Here's where it plays out in my life on that side, the performer side, right? And so they were struggling. They weren't struggling with the knowledge side of it. They were struggling with the application side of it. Agreed? How do I know? Because he told them to ask for wisdom, didn't he? You know, in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse 1, it says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. That's confident expectation, by the way. And the conviction of things not seen. You can put that, that's an A side and B side. You can put the A side over on the hearing and believing. And you can put the performance side, the B part, on the other side. Assurances of things hoped for, that's the promises. And the conviction of not seeing, that's waiting on God to do what he promised. Did he not promise you? Uh, he's not going to hang you out to dry. Whatever that means. Well, I've gone, I've gone over time. So let's have a word of prayer, take the offering. I'm still going to give you 15 minutes. Okay? I take your time, I'll take it back later. Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity to gather. We have the freedom. We're thankful. We pray for a continuation of that. We pray that we would maximize the freedom we have out in the streets and the highway and the hedges to carry that gospel as far as we can carry it and then send somebody that's willing to carry it further. I pray for this offering today, Father, that we would be good stewards of it, and we are. We're as good as we know how to be. We try to spend it on everybody else in getting the message out and as little on ourselves as we can. And we're thankful for that. Thankful for a congregation that is generous and never browbeaten or over money. This is a privilege to give. It's not a command. It's a privilege. As a man purposes in his heart, so should he give. We pray for our missionaries today. This is the month of missionary offering. And here we are at the end of the month. We need to supply these people with, equip them. The best we can do right here, not knowing what their needs are, is to give them the money and the resources to do with it because we know the missionaries we support are godly people. They take this money serious and they put it strictly into ministry where the dollar is maximized and, and multiplied by the grace of God. And we're thankful for that in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been talking about this passage of James where he says to pray for wisdom. Uh, they were struggling with undeserved suffering. And it comes in various forms, various types. And they were struggling with it, and they were struggling with it. He asked for wisdom, and then the wisdom to be able to fix it. He said, uh, and twice he said, uh, he said in verse 5, let him ask of God. And then he said in verse 6, let him ask in faith. And so he's, he's explaining to us or to the people how this is going. So we, we, we talked about Sophia being a practical application of knowledge of, the, of specific word of God and what needs to be applied in real time reality of your life. And I, wanna, I want you to go with me to 1 Kings. 1 Kings. I, I want to illustrate this with a story that most of you are familiar with. Um, I want to go into a little detail with it. And it's Solomon. Solomon has just become king. Uh, ac acknowledged king of all of Israel. And 
he's made this famous prayer. This, this prayer is well known and famous. I want to cover this subject matter. Uh, well, actually, I go through the whole chapter. I want to show you how I broke it down in order to look at my subject matter of praying for wisdom and how that is identified in a person's life in reality, in real time, as, and, and when it is, other people can see it as well. People outside can see it. So I'm in 1 Kings 3. Solomon has just become king of all of Israel as they acknowledged uh, he, he's been crowned. And the first thing in uh, verses 1 through 10 is my first section. And I'll just kind of walk you through it. Um, He's gotten, he's, he's had an alliance marriage with um, uh, the king, of, with Pharaoh of Egypt. And, he, and th this is in the ancient world is how they uh, made alliances between c countries. Uh, Egypt apparently doesn't realize that a child from her couldn't sit on the throne. But that's the kind of stuff they did back in that day. Um, uh, that, that could never happen in Israel, but he did. He did marry uh, a daughter of Pharaoh, and that's one thing. As he comes in, an alliance. No, that's an alliance marriage. Um, another thing that's happened that's important to this study. At the time he became king, because there was no tabernacle, there was no uh, temple, uh, there was no quote house of worship. For the Israelites, they, they, pra they did their sacrifices and practiced their religion on the high places th th that, that were devoted to idolatry. They basically took it over, took those high places over, idolatrous places, and tried to coexist with it. And, of course, that, that doesn't work with God. So, but they, the Israelites have been practicing that. He comes along and he goes to Gibeon. Notice in here he goes to Gibeon uh, in verse 4 to sacrifice at the great high place. In other words, he's the king and he goes to the king of places. And he offers a thousand burnt offerings. And it's interesting to me how the Lord deals with him. Now, that's way out of line. And yet as a new king, the, the Lord really deals with him. In, in, in kind of an amazing way. He's going to do it early, remember, in his years, not later. But in, in verse 5, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night and said, Ask what you wish me to give you. Now, he's the king. And he says to the, the king, Ask what you wish me to give you. And Solomon said, and I love verses 6 through 9. Because we're told when we pray, we should begin with thanksgiving, right? In, and if you want to know what that really means in real time, read verses 6 through 9, because it's about praising who God is. That's a magnificent... This guy was really... I mean, he tells God what he knows about God in real time. The, 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 you know, when we put the essence box up, you know, God is omniscient and all that. Well, when, he, when you praise God, you're talking back to God out of his essence, how it, how it plays out in real time. The omnipresence, the omnipotence, the sovereignty, all of that stuff in real time. That's what praise is. Well, when you, when you study verses 6 through 9, as he, as he prays to God, uh, you know, this is in a dream. He says, ask what you want. And so he, he, the first thing he does he knows what he, when he says ask, he knows that, that that's a prayer. That's code word for prayer. So he begins by praising God. We call it giving thanks, giving, right? The giving of thanks is praising God's essence as you've come to understand it. Look, Solomon said, Thou hast shown great loving kindness to thy servant David, my father, and accordingly, Accordingly, as he walked before thee in truth and righteousness, uprightness of heart toward thee, thou hast reserved for him this great loving kindness. Then verse 7, And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king in place of my father David. 
Yes, I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out and how to come in. And it shows his dependence on God. And he says, thy servant is in the midst of thy people. Thou hast chosen a great people, a great people. Uh, I mean, innumerous to count, a multitude. And you've given them, you've made me a servant to these wonderful people. I mean, uh, who, but he says, he says, but who is able to judge this great people of yours? Right? So he has this, this whole Thanksgiving period. My father was, I mean, you talk about shoes too big to fill. Oh, father, my father was, I mean, his shoes are way too big. And I'm, I'm just honored that you would select me to, to, to do that. But listen, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a babe in this. And, and I need that. I know I need you, right? I mean, who is able to judge these great people of yours? And then verse 7, and it was, watch this, this whole praise part of your prayer life. See, I don't think many of us, we pray. I know you have a great prayer life. You should always start your prayer life other than confession of sin to be sure <laughs> that the prayer is purposeful. You should begin with thanksgiving. You know why I think it's good to, to write? Like, for me, I do it, I have a, I have a weekly planner. I write all the hot, hot stuff in that. I, that's how I journal. And I can look at it and I can go, Ooh, I remember that. Ooh, I remember that. Because when it comes time to make your prayers, where you've got some time, I'm not talking about those shoot up a prayer because I'm, you know, we've all got those. You know, I'm in the emergency room. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm talking about when you have that quiet time, when you clear off everything out of your life. I don't know when that is, about midnight, and if you got kids. About <laughs> I don't know. I know there's not much of that, but when there is, when you clean it out, first thing you ought to do is have that time where you thank God. There's a whole season of thanks before you get to your request. Because, and I'm going to tell you why that's important because verse 10. Look at verse 10. It was pleasing in the sight of the Lord that Solomon had, had said, had asked this thing. What did he ask? Who is able to judge these people of thine? Okay. Your, ser your servant needs an understanding heart to judge these people, to discern between good and evil. I mean, who is able to judge these great people of yours, God? And this, 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 listen, this pleases the Lord. And then verses 11 through 15, the Lord said to Solomon, because you've asked this thing, and watch this. This, this, this is what pleases God. Because you have asked this thing and have not asked for yourself long life, nor have you asked for riches for yourself. Nor have you asked for the life of your enemies. No, you have asked for yourself discernment to understand justice. Now look. He is now in a position that God wants him to be king of the priest nation of Israel. And in that position as king, he has asked for a discerning, wise heart to be able to bring justice to the people of God, good and bad. You know, to be able to discern between good and bad and bring, bring justice. Behold, I have come. Listen to God. Behold, I have come. I have done according to your words. Behold, I have given you a wise and discerning heart. Boy, that was quick. You know why? Because he has the knowledge. How does God know he has knowledge? He listened to his introductory prayer. Solomon. 
so that there, there has been no one like you before you. I'm going to give you such a wise and discerning heart. There has never been anyone like you before, nor shall one be like you after you. I mean, that's what God wants to do with you. When you, ask, when you ask for wisdom, when you ask a God according to his will, this is, listen, he wants to push his will out of your life so much farther than what you ask, but he's only going to give you what you're able to take. But what he wants to give is so much greater. So grow in his grace and he'll give it all to you in the time. Right? I mean, you, don't you do that with your children? They're three-year-olds and they want a truck. I got a four-year-old that wants a truck. I'm not going to give him a gasoline engine. I won't go down the store and buy him a little pedal your little self around the house. Not going to put a battery in it. No, this is called exercise, and he don't know it. <laughs> Not that you have to really give a four-year-old exercise, I understand. I do remember that. Let's see. That I have also given you. Here's also. 13. And I have, I have also given you what you have not asked. See how important prayer is? God surveys the whole thing and he goes like, I love you. I love you. I've got so much more in store for you, but your heart could never ask for that because that, that's too far out there. The year before, I've told you this story, but the year before I went with Billy Graham, I asked for 12 people to be converted. Little church in Pine Mountain. I had 12 people before I left. I want to get saved. I've been working four years with them. Give me these, give me these 12, Father. I got called to go with the Graham organization. I left. At the end of that first year, I saw 250,000 people converted to Christ. I saw them. Well, how? There were so many people getting saved. I couldn't even come home and say, well, what kind of a deal? Did, I mean, how, how, how is things going? I couldn't even tell him. Well, 100,000 people got saved last night. 250,000 people. Nobody believed you. They believed 12, but they never believed. So I, I went, up, well, it's, things are going pretty good. I didn't tell anybody because nobody would believe me. You know what I'm telling you when I say that God has so much more? Listen, he loved the fact that I cared that 12 people get saved. And he pulled me out of there before I got the 12 saved and gave me 250,000. I mean, is that not mind-boggling? Oh, I know. You're thinking, I don't think that. Probably not all of them were saved. Well, how would you, would you have questioned the 12? What are you talking about? It, I, my point is this. What I, learned, what I learned from God in that first year was just, look, sit back and enjoy the ride, baby. Because he's got so much more out there on behalf of what you're doing than you could possibly imagine. And that was sure true. Listen, it's a, it's a miracle here. I've also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there will not be any among the kings like you all your days. That, that's a gift. And if you walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and commandments, as your father David walked, then I will prolong your days. Solomon awoke. I'll tell you what he did. He just did like you and I. He awoke and wrote all that down. <laughs> Don't you imagine? I mean, if God had said that, I mean, I'd have, at first, but I wrote that all down before that got cold. Solomon woke and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. And listen to what he did. He offered burnt offerings and made peace offerings and made a feast for his servant. He's back in the saddle, ain't he? Forget that high places. God's got bigger things for me than that. Now, now it comes to the practical application of wisdom. Ask for wisdom and, and what we're looking for is real time. Agreed? So here's that famous story. Two harlots living in the same house get pregnant at the same time. 
They have babies. There's nobody else living with them at this time. Because they, got, they have babies, I suppose. <laughs> Anyhow, that shows you my age. So, they're three days apart. They're doing a no-no. They're sleeping with their babies. That's a no-no, right? That's a no-no. Because of the very thing that happened, one of the ladies rolled over during the night and smothered her child and died. Before the other woman awoke in the morning, she took the dead baby, put it in bed with the, uh, and took the other baby out, the living baby, and put it in her bed. In the morning got up, the woman woke up, looked at the child, realized the child was dead, looked at the child carefully and realized it was not her child, confronted the other woman, and the other woman denied it, said that her baby wasn't dead, that hers was, and she knew her baby, that she knew her baby, and that wasn't hers. The dead baby wasn't her. So they went to court. They went to court. And you understand how this went. Both of them, one said one thing, one said the other, and there was no coming to any kind of agreement on it. So Solomon said, give, told the servant, go get me my sword. He brought the sword into the room. And he said, well, since we can't come to agreement, I'm going to take my sword and divide the child. The mother that was the mother of the, real, of the living child said, no, 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 please don't do that. No, 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 no. Don't kill this child. Go ahead and give it to her. And Solomon told the servant, take the child from that woman and give it to that woman there because that's the real mother. Because the other woman said, that's a good deal. Divide the child. And so this became a famous case in Israel. And all of Israel, look at verse 28. When all of Israel heard of the judgment which the king had handed down, they feared the king, they reverenced the king, they reverenced his wisdom, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice in their nation. See, that's what he prayed for. That's what God gave him, even though God wanted so much more for him. And the bottom line was, he had the wisdom in the practical application, didn't he? See, wisdom is the practical application of wise counsel. In this case, a judge with justice. And so that's what you're asking for in this great discussion. This is what we're asking for. And listen. Do you suppose that prayer that he made, I need, I want, I need, I, I pray for wisdom. I want a discerning heart to know good from evil. I'm a king. I need to know how to administer justice to this great people of yours because he's a king. Listen, here we are. We're just, me and you, <laughs> we're just good old boys. We're just good, just good old people. And yet he says, I want you to ask for wisdom. In regard to things you're struggling with, there's a breakdown in your life in, in, in faith. And it's very simple. You look at it. You look at hearing faith. Oh, I got it. You look at believing faith. I got it. Where's the breakdown? It has to be on the performance side. I'm struggling with getting this out in adjustment. And he says, okay, you've asked for the right. Listen, if you haven't asked for wisdom, ask for wisdom now. Because God said, I'll give it to you. How? Generously. Right? I'll give you, listen, generously, more than you can eat. It's a doggy bag. More than you need. More than you would even ask for. You, but listen, it just thrills God's heart to hear you that way. And then he'll show you what this is about. And when he shows it to you, other people will see it. See, other people can't see it because you've got it hid. You, you can't see it. When you see it, other people. Listen, when I saw that God wanted me to be a, a pastor teacher, other people saw it. Until I recognized it, it no, nobody else recognized it.
I mean, verse 28 is a powerful verse in the aftermath of all that's going on. Psalms 51, 6, his father David, his father David, you know, he said, Father, man, I've had a great example in my life. I hope my children can say that about me. I've had a great example in my life. My father was a person that walked with the Lord. And David was that man. Wasn't perfect, was he? But he always got back on his feet for the Lord. Always got back on his feet. Had a race to run. He had a course to finish. Needed to keep the faith. And God bless him. He always got back on his feet, humbled himself before God and pushed forward. And here's what he writes, Psalms 51, 6. You're very familiar with Psalms 51, I know. Listen to what he says. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being. In the hidden part, you will make me known, will make me known, will make known to me is actually what that should say. In the inner parts, you will make known to me wisdom. You know what that is? That's inner dialogue. That's God speaking to you through the power of the Holy Spirit. That is God speaking to you. Listen to that now. Behold your desire. You desire truth in the innermost being. And in the hidden part, you will make known to me wisdom in the most inner part. Say what inner part. See, that's the Holy, that, listen, that's the spirit and the soul, the Holy Spirit working with it. When he teaches it in the word of God, he recalls it. He pushes it to the human spirit. The human spirit says, I know what I know. Right? I mean, the spirit says, I know what I know. I know, I, a person will say, I know what you just said to me. I know what you said. And I say, well, you misunderstood me. Well, then you better clear it up because I know what you just told me. <laughs> yeah, that's an interaction. That's, that's where that inner dialogue goes on. And what you need to do is make sure that when that inner dialogue is going on, that that's a spiritual dialogue and not just a fleshly dialogue. Agreed? Well, we, we've talked a lot about this. And here's one of those places, the inner dialogue of the spirit. The, the soul, doctrine in the soul, the human spirit reflecting. And, and that's where that inner dialogue. And that's, that's often, you know, we get something and it runs through a cycle in our soul and, and the spirit reflects on it. And, and it reflects and we feel this way and we feel that way. And reflect, we reflect, the spirit reflects on what's going on. It's a mirror. It's a mirror. It's a mirror. Well, anyhow, in, in uh, Ecclesiastes 2.21, when, when there is a man who has labored with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, then he gives it to the one who has not labored with them. This too is vanity and great evil. When you have wisdom, you give it to a person that doesn't get a who about it. You might as well just throw it out the window. You know, you, people say that about it. You give that kid any more dollars, you might just throw it out the window. Right? Am I the only guy that's done that and go like, you dummy? We ain't going to do that anymore. No, you want, it, you want it next time? Go earn it. How do you think I got my dollar? Give you no more to throw. Might as well throw it out the window. I ain't going to do either one anymore. <laughs> Whether you have an appreciation for my money, <laughs> I do. So I could do that. When there is a man who has labored with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then he gives it freely, right? Gives it to somebody who has no appreciation for it is what he means. This is vanity. Let me close. In verse 6, he, he, puts, he puts another trailer hitch. Puts a trailer hitch. Let him ask in faith. That's verse 6. That's the trailer hitch. And that's where I'm going next week. Let him ask in faith. That, notice that's an imperative. This introduces the second imperative in this, in this passage, 5 through 8. <laughs> 
And if you remember, we had two in the other one. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you go to, today. But listen, here's how you pray. And I laid it out for you on that. So, you know, make sure your prayer, you're praying right so you can get through. And when you get through, <clears throat> then God will answer you. And good things will come to your life. The good thing is wisdom. The ability to be content with what's going on and have the savvy how to understand what God is doing in your life to be content with it, to find joy in it. The joy is not going to come in the morning. It's going to come when you wake up. That may be in the morning, but I mean, you should be able to have joy because of what's going on in your life, not, not because it's going to change. Right? Have the joy while you're going through the experience. See, we all wait while... <laughs> I'll have joy in the morning, <laughs> but not tonight. Okay. You need to quit that. You need to quit that. Father, we're so thankful for these who have come with ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts to believe. And we pray, Father, they would examine the scriptures, the content, and at some point believe it, at some point apply it, and at some point wait on God to deliver the promises. We call it the faith cycle. And somewhere when that breaks down, we get in a funky place. Like the, like the congregation James is trying to coach. Like the congregation I'm trying to coach. To encourage. This is a good place to be in your life. It's not a bad place. It's not a bad place. Pray for wisdom. God will give it liberally, generously. He will bring you to understand it. He will show you a bigger picture and move you towards it. He did with Paul. He did with Jesus. He did with Job. He did with Solomon. I mean, how many examples do we need to know? Is that's the way it works? There they are, for we've made our prayer, Jesus. Amen.